Hi, this is Dr. Rob with a short screencast to help you understand the basics of debt financial instruments. What we're going to do is talk about a bond, but everything that you know um, about bonds can be applied to any other type of debt, debt instrument, whether it be um, a more sophisticated type of loan or whether it, be, it just be something as simple as a home loan. But we've got to get the terminology out of the way in the first place. So, so let's just tell you what a bond looks like. Now, what I've actually drawn here is something that's meant to look like a bond. The grey box is a document. And if we go back to the 19th century, that's what a bond was. It was a lovingly engraved instrument to make sure that people couldn't copy it too easily. Because some of these had your name on them, but some didn't. Some were bearer bonds. So if you gave them to somebody else, they could collect the money that the bond would entitle you to. Now, bonds only have three important bits of information. Firstly, the face value. This is the amount that the issuer of the, issuer of the bond promises to repay at the end of the bond's term. So if I'm borrowing money and you're lending to me, I promise to give you, in this case, a hundred bucks at the end of the bond term. The second bit of information is the term of the bond. Now, in this case, I've specified it quite simply, a term of four years. Um, a term could be eight, six month periods. It could be 10 years. Now, why the length of the period matters is because payments are made regularly before the bond expires. And these are referred to as coupon payments. So in this example, what we've got is a bond with a face value of $100 and a term of four years. And we've got some coupons at the side. Firstly, let's talk about the coupon rate. Then let's talk about why it's incorrect to call that a, an interest rate. The coupon rate tells you the relationship between the face value and the coupon payments regularly made. So this bond with face value of $100, a term of four years, and a coupon rate of 10% is actually promising the following cash flows. Each coupon payment is going to be 10% of the face value. So after one year, the person who's lent me the money is going to get $10. At the end of the second year, they're going to get another $10. At the end of the third year, they're going to get another $10. And at the end of the fourth year, they're going to get the last $10, and they're going to get their face value of $100 back. So what this bond is promising, just looking at these three items, face value, term, and coupon rate, it tells you the cash flows that are being promised to the, to the lender. You lend me some money and I'm going to give you 10 bucks every year for four years. And at the end, when I give you the last 10 bucks, I'm also going to give you back your $100 face value. Now, if you happen to give me $100 for this instrument, then that coupon is exactly going to be equal to your interest, right? It'll be a 10% interest rate. But you might not give me 100 bucks. You might give me less or more. So if that's the case, a coupon isn't going to be the same as interest. We'll talk a little bit about that a little later. Now, just one more comment. Why is it called coupon? Why is the payment called a coupon? Why is it called a coupon rate? Um, you're probably all too young to remember, but when I was a kid, you'd buy comics or magazines and there'd be an opportunity to join a fan club. And at the side, there'd be a little coupon. You fill in your address, the little dotted lines, you cut around, you send it off. They sign you up to a fan club and they send you um, the relevant propaganda. So a coupon is simply an item of paper that you cut out and you get something in return for it. Well, this is exactly what it was with bonds when they were issued in paper form. What you would do, depending on the company issuing the bond, if you had one of these bonds, each year, or each six months, how many, however often the coupon payment was made, you'd cut out your little coupon, you'd take it to the company and they'd give you $10. Or if they were a big company and they had something organized with the post office, you take it to the post office, the post office would give you $10. So the reason it's called a coupon was it, was it used to actually be a physical coupon that you cut out off the edge of this fancy engraved bond instrument. So that's why we call it coupon. Okay, now let's look at the four key numbers in each period. And I, I've set this up in a way um, that doesn't exactly reflect the bond we've just looked at but reflects what a home loan might look like. Now, this I think is all pretty obvious, right? Um, if you lend me some money, then what's gonna happen each period? Two things are gonna happen. You're gonna earn some interest, 
and from me and I'm going to make a payment to you. Now, if it was that bond before and you gave me $100, the coupon payment and the interest would be the same. But if you look at something like a home loan, it's not going to be the same. What happens when you take out a home loan? Well, you're not just expected to make the interest payments, you're meant to pay down the loan as well. So by the end of the long period, it's zero. So this screen basically shows what a home loan would look like. You've got an opening balance. Each period, some interest gets added to that. A payment comes off it. And you know, at the end of the period, the closing balance is smaller. And then of course, next year, um, some more interest gets calculated. Hopefully as the balance gets smaller, the interest also gets smaller. So the coupon payment might be the same as the interest, in which case your loan isn't going to go down and you're going to have to um, make a payment at the end. Or your coupon payment might be bigger than the interest, in which case you'll be paying the loan down, you know, like my home loan, eventually it gets to zero. Okay, so it's important to understand here that the interest is calculated based on the opening balance. It's not necessarily the same as the payment. In fact, if you take a loan from the bank, what do banks usually do? Well, they make sure the payment is bigger than the interest because they don't want you just paying off the interest. They want you paying the loan back in the end. All right, so let's come back to the bond. Now, remember with the bond, um, I said there's the face value and I made the comment that people might not necessarily give you that amount. Well, why might that be the case? Well, think about what lenders control. Going back to the bond, what am I promising you with this bond? I'm promising you four payments of 10 bucks and at the end I'm promising you a hundred dollar face value. So I'm promising you 10, 10, 10, 110. Now if you're happy with a 10% rate of return, how much are you going to give me for that? Well, you'll give me a hundred bucks, right? If you give me a hundred now and I'll give you 10 each year, that's your 10% return and at the end you get your money back. But what if you're not happy with a 10% rate of return? I mean, you might give me more than the face value. So you might give me a premium of five. So even though it's a face value of 100, you might give me 105. Or you might give me less than 100. You know, the face value is 100, but for some reason, you're only willing to give me $91. So there's a discount of nine, if you like. So the question we need to ask now is, why would people pay you more or less than the face value of the bond? Well, let, let's think this through logically. Um, now, you know, there's a lot of writing on this slide. Let's just just think about what's going on. The blue pile is how much people are going to give you up front. The pile on the right is what you promise them. So we've got two things to compare. What they lend you, that's going to be the opening balance of the bond at the start, and what you promise them. Well, what are you promising them? You're promising them the face value at the end and a bunch of coupon payments over time. Now here I've actually put the opening balance as smaller than the face value, but it could be bigger. The important thing to realize here is that people's return, if they lend you money, their return, and, and this is going to sound really obvious, their return is just the difference between what they gave you and what you gave them back. Right? That's what return is. Now rate of return depends on timing, but return, difference between what you put in and what you get back. Right, so if I give you 100 bucks now, you give me 110 a year from now, it's a 10% rate of return. Now, let's look at what these guys who are going to lend you money control. I mean, what do you do with a bond? You print a prospectus that gives all the conditions of the bond, the face value, etc. You put it out there into the market and you hope people buy it. You hope people buy this bond. They invest in it. But the thing is, when you print the prospectus, you've got to lock in what you're promising people. So you're going to lock in the face value, you're going to lock in the coupon payments you're promising to give them. Now, maybe you you just, for various reasons, you got the coupon wrong. It doesn't reflect the interest rate. You might have done it intentionally, um, but we're not going to talk about things like zero coupon bonds here. Um, so for some reason, you got the interest rate wrong. You know, let's say that you think you're at 10% risk, so people should be happy with 10% from you. But you know, maybe mark interest rates change in the market, or maybe you made incorrect assumptions about what people assume your risk is. Yeah, you know, let's assume, to reflect this this slide, let's assume that they think you're actually riskier than you thought you were. So you thought, hey, a 10% rate of return would make people happy, but people step back and say, well, you know what, this guy's pretty risky. I think we want a higher rate of return to compensate us for that risk, so we want 12%. All right, so these guys are going to work out how much they're willing to give you. The riskier you are, 
the more return they want. Now, the only thing they control is how much they pay. Right? You've already written down what you've promised them, the face value and the coupon payments. So all, you can, all they can change is how much they are willing to pay you. Okay? If they want a bigger return, they give you less upfront. And see, this is what's going on here. The blue box is the only thing they control. So why might they give you less than face value? Because they want a bigger rate of return that you're promising them implicitly in the coupon. They might give you more. If, if they're happy with a smaller rate of return, hey, if you give them face value, it's 10%. But if you're happy with 8%, somebody else can come along and say, hey, I'll give you more than 100 bucks. So the price will get bid up. So how do they work out that price? How do they work out that opening balance that they're going to lend you? Well, we know that their return is the difference between what they put in and what they give you back. So if they want a bigger return, they give you less. If they're happy with a smaller return, they're going to give you more. Okay, so how do they work out how much they're actually going to give you? Well, this is where the present value formula comes in. Now, you know, present value th seems like a theoretical abstraction. You know, not everybody feels comfortable with the idea that money has a time value. Is it inflation? Is it what? Um, and it's not my role here to help you understand how present value works. But I'm going to show you why it works for loans, even if you don't believe any of the other rubbish about present value. So uh, let's set up a basic example without putting some numbers in. Let's say that people are going to lend you an amount X. Right, that's the blue amount that they're trying to decide how much to lend you. Each year, interest gets added. So if interest is 10%, you multiply by 1.1, 1, .1, 1 plus i. And a coupon payment happens. Okay, that's C. So the interest gets added on, you multiply by 1 plus i, that's adding the interest rate of i percent, and a coupon payment gets taken off. And at the end, they owe you zero. So let's set up a simple bond, a two-year bond. Have a look at the next page. Now what I'm setting up here, I'm going to talk you through this, is how the loan looks over time. So they lend you X. So how much do you owe them? X. Duh. At the end of the first year, they've earned some interest. So the balance has gone up. You know, if it was $100 at the beginning, and the interest rate's 10%, it's now going to be 110. 1 plus 0.1 times 100, 110. So 1 plus I, X, is the balance at the end of the first year. Of course, in the first year, there's also a coupon payment, so the coupon payment comes off. Now, if the coupon is equal to interest, we'll be back to X, but it might not be. I think we've demonstrated why it might not be. Okay, so your balance at the end of the first year is X times 1 plus I minus C. Well, what do you do to that balance in the second year? The same thing you did in the first year. Add some interest, so multiply by 1 plus I. So there we've got the form for that. I've just put square brackets around the balance and multiplied by 1 plus I. And that year we also take off a payment. So there's another C coming off. Now, if this is a normal home loan, um, that'll give you zero. If this is a bond where they've got a face value payment to make at the end, then at the end there's a face value that's got to come off as well. And once the face value has come off, the balance is zero. So the balance is zero because the loan is paid off. Okay, I hope that makes sense about how the balance changes over time. Um, with essentially any sort of loan. Let's rearrange this formula to show you that we can work out X using present value. In fact, this formula there in the yellow box is just a simplified version of the present value formula. So, to the next slide. I've taken that formula across. See, it's the same. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange stuff. You know, going back to high school maths. So, firstly, add FV to both sides taken off the minus FV off the left-hand side, added to the right-hand side, where there was a zero before. Now that last coupon payment, added on to both sides. So I've crossed it out on the left-hand side, it's plus C on the right-hand side. Now divide both sides by 1 plus I. Cross it off on the left-hand side, divide by 1 plus I on the right-hand side. Now, add C. remember, we're trying to work out X, right? We're trying to work out how much people would pay. So now add C to both sides. So take off the C there, add on the C on the right hand side and I put it on a separate line just to make it seem a little clearer. Um, so what have we got? I've just rewritten it now without any rent stuff. So 1 plus I X equals fair value plus C divided by 1 plus I plus C. Well we've still got a 1 plus I on the left hand side so let's divide both sides by 1 plus I. So the left hand side is now X, 
the right hand side, the fv plus c was previously divided by 1 plus i, now it's divided by 1 plus i squared, and the c was previously divided by, by 1, now it's divided by 1 plus i. Hmm, x equals fv plus c divided by 1 plus i squared. Remember that fv and that c are two periods away. Plus c minus divided by 1 plus i. That c is one period away. So for this two period bond, how much are they going to pay you? What's x? Well, x is just the first coupon a year away divided by 1 plus i plus the payments in the second year, the face value and the coupon, divided by 1 plus i squared. Hey, that's just the two period present value formula. Right, so if you look at how a loan works, getting to that yellow formula just involves working through all the things that happened to the loan. If you know that you started with X, you can work out what X is. How much would people be willing to give you if I is the rate of return that they want and C and FV are the cash payments you're promising? Well, you can rearrange the equation and you can work out what X is. So that's why people use present value to work out how much they give you. So let's just go back a few slides. What are they willing to pay for the bond? How do they work that out? They take the present value of everything you promise them. And if the interest rate that they if the rate of return they want is bigger, that's going to involve the present value being discounted more. So they're going to give you less money. Right? They can't control what you give them back. All they can control is what they give you. And the difference is the return. So to get a bigger return, they offer you less money. To get a smaller return, they're happy to offer you more money. I hope that makes it makes some sense. Okay, that's enough from me on this topic.